Brett, have you ever talked to someone that's earned eight Academy Awards, 11 Grammys, one Tony, and one Emmy? Not that I can recall. Well, you're going to today because we have our interview with Alan Menken. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. This is the Beyond the Mouse podcast, the podcast for all things Disney for NPR Illinois Community Voices and for the Front Row Network. I am your host today, Craig. I'm joined today by an illustrious panel of co-hosts. First of all, Mr. Brett Rutherford. How are you, sir? Good. Thanks. Very good. And also Vanessa Ferguson. I'm doing illustriously well. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. We also are bringing in the boss. We're bringing in the editor-in-chief of the Front Row Network, Mr. Jeremy Geckner. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm only here because, you know, the complaints are starting to mount quite a bit. So, you know, we need a little bit of supervision now, but that's okay. That's okay. Okay. (laughs) Actually, Jeremy is here for a very special reason. We are excited to bring you our interview with Alan Menken, Disney legend, Alan Menken, EGOT winner, Alan Menken. Uh, The name is just synonymous with the Disney Renaissance and also really all Disney films over the last, say, 30 to 40 years. It's just incredible the amount of work that he has done, also bringing musicals to the stage. I'm so excited for this opportunity that we had the other day and excited to bring you this interview because I think we go into a lot of really cool areas and conversation pieces with Alan. Uh, Jeremy, your thoughts on the interview that we had and that we're going to be presenting to our audience today. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible uh, thing to talk to somebody this legendary. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, we made mention of it in there, but I did study the music of Alan Menken for two years in college in my music composition program. And the amount of creativity this, this man has fostered into the world is, is just insane. And when you start seeing his resume, it's, you know, a lot of people might not know all of the songs and all of the music he's written in his career. And it usually does just blow you away. Even somebody that studied him, I always go to his IMDb. I'm like, oh, right. He wrote that. Um, so um, it's just incredible to get to talk to somebody that is that creative and that shaped so many childhoods uh, just with the, the gifts that he has in, inside. His music impacts millions of people daily. That's just incredible. Vanessa, your thoughts on the interview we had uh, that you're all going to get to listen to in just a moment. Oh, well, you all are in for a treat because Alan and I curate a menu, a dinner menu, and you'll see soon what I'm talking about. Enjoy. I'm positive that he usually does not get that question in interviews. So I'm excited for our audience to hear that. Brett, you're the last person standing in the way of our interview with Alan Menken. What are your thoughts before we get into it? Well, I know that we're recording this, you know, after the fact, but I'm I, I'm still wearing the same clothes because I haven't moved because I've just been stunned with the excitement of an Alan Menken interview. So I let's do that. Without any further ado, here is our interview with Disney legend, EGOT winner, just all around amazing, phenomenally talented person, Alan Menken. We are truly honored to bring to the show, Alan Menken. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, how are you doing? I'm just doing, I'm on cloud nine, actually. It's just a (laughs) tremendous honor to get to speak to you. Um, And I get to the honor of asking our first question. And we are trying to give you some new questions that maybe you hadn't had before. Uh, But I do have to start with one that you probably get often asked. And that is, uh, last year you earned your Emmy. And so now you are one of 16 people to have been awarded with the EGOT. Uh, And I know you also often bring up you have a Razzie as well. Um, But what's that feeling like to have such a recognition of your whole body of work like that? Well, it's it's nice. It's very nice. Um, I'll give you a a truly honest answer. I think, you know, an EGOT is sort of a construction, so to speak, of these awards and we make it into a big deal and it's very, very gratifying. And there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of incredible people who have not won EGOTs who are nonetheless for it. Um, it was nice to get it out of the way since everyone asked me about it. And I, and I, I, I really wasn't thinking about it until people started asking me about it. I said, oh, okay, I guess I got to get this EGOT thing. But yeah, it's nice. It, it, it is nice. I have, I have no complaints about it. So it's nice. 
That's wonderful. Vanessa, you have our next question. Yes. Well, we are very much enjoying meeting you. We've learned uh, more about your career and researching for this interview, but we also want to learn more about who you are. I'm the daughter of a pianist, so I know what it's like to see my parent is not a musician, but just as mom to us. Of course, you are a legendary composer, Alan Menken, but how would your family describe you? Who, who are you? I mean, certainly my career has, has played a you know, major role, I guess, in their lives. Um, I'm dad, totally. I'm Janice's husband. Um, Janice and I are kind of opposites in a way. Janice is very detail oriented and very every little thing. And I tend to be sort of, you know, the, the artist with his head in the clouds a bit. Um, and so, she, you know, she's always reminding me, Alan, get your head out of the clouds. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, I think it's, we're a pretty normal family, given the extraordinary things that have also obviously gone into uh, my life and career. I mean, not every kid gets to grow up, you know, sort of at Disney World, so to speak, or at the Oscars. And, and in a way, it's, it's really nice for them. And in a way, it makes life more difficult for them, to be honest. Um, it, it really raises expectations in a way that is not fair for them. And I've made it look like fun. And clearly it's hard work. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, you know, being the child of somebody who is um, in the business and especially one who has achieved um, you know, some real notoriety. And um, I wouldn't trade it because it's, it's essentially who I am, that, that connection to music, that connection to music in, in stories and songs, that's very deep connection for me. Um, so it's really important to me. And it, it, it does shape a lot of, of who I am, but also, you know, when I'm done here, I'm gonna go into the house and I actually am the cook and make dinner. And, <laughs> and then Janice and I will, you know, watch our mysteries or whatever, you know, it's, it's it's just life yeah yeah i love that what are you making tonight well i'm actually defrosting a chicken uh. um <laughs> it may not be defrosted in time i might make some veggie burgers thank you for asking though it's <laughs> <laughs> we'll come over for dinner as soon as we're done with this <laughs> i'd be a disappointment but come on over sure <laughs> No, I hear you there. I, I'm actually, uh, I'm uh, cooking uh, tonight as well. I have, my wife always works late at night, so I always have to cook too. So there you go. We'll trade some recipes sometimes. Um, okay, great. So uh, Craig already embarrassed me enough saying that I studied your work for two years um, in college. Um, but in that time, it wasn't uh, so much the songs that, that got me as much as your scores that you wrote for these films. And I just, those songs stand out to me so much just in the way they incorporate those songs we've already heard in the melodies of the underscores. Um, and it, it really reminds me of Broadway shows, how they like to do that. Uh, is this something that you've insisted on doing ever since the start of your career? Like, have you insisted you wanted to do the score for the films as well? Well, no, I didn't start out insisting at all. And in fact, you know, the first experience I had in films really was, I suppose, the, the film version of Little Shop of Horrors. And in that instance, uh, I, I, I didn't even think to, you know, to, uh, to do the score. Um, we were really working in theater and, and the, the movie came out and then we found out, Alan, Little Shop's been nominated for best score. I went, wow, great. And I look it up, his best score, Miles Goodman. And Miles Goodman, he's that passed away. He was a very talented film scorer uh, but Miles basically wrote, I think, eight or nine minutes of adaptation, sort of, you know, interstitial music. And most of the underscore was what we had had already for the stage show. But I was not eligible for any recognition because I'd already written it for the stage show. Mm -hmm. So when we, when Howard and I then did Little Mermaid, he said, you should score it. I said, but I, I never, I don't, I don't know how to do that, and I learn, <laughs> and so I learned. And Little Mermaid was actually my first film score, and uh, 
it was of course you know won me an oscar which i you know amazed by it's it's a very simple um unsophisticated score and it it, it use a uses the the themes from the songs but also it also introduces new themes throughout it was very successful and i did find that i i loved scoring and and yes i primarily enjoy scoring as in the context of songs um there's this there's something extra in the um when a message is coming through songs especially you know songs that come from story and then infuse the rest of the the underscore that's really powerful so i think of each of these scores in a way as one work and then also as individual elements as well um and now it's it's something um you know that i'm that i'm used to but again with with, for, with uh, little mermaid i so okay i'll try it so so you want an oscar your first time out that's that's about right <laughs> yeah i mean i first three times out i won yeah. <laughs> three times out i Not won two oscars counting, each yeah, time that's great. And then they changed the rules, and we still won an Oscar for, for <laughs> Pocahontas. And I finally stopped winning Oscars with Hunchback of Notre Dame, which may be my best score. Yeah, but, boo um, to that. But, <laughs> oh man! But you know, it's, I mean, a lot of that is it, yes, it's the quality of the score, but it's also the amount the amount that the score actually influences and drives the storyline. And it, with a musical, it's allowed to. It's, it's like your job to drive it. So you do have an extra sort of advantage. So that for a while, they they, they said, okay, we're going to separate scores that are purely underscore and then scores that are from song driven uh, projects. Uh, and then they just disqualified scores that are from <laughs> song driven projects. Um, so it's, you know, no one's quite figured out how to, how to do the comparison between a pure underscore without songs or an underscore with one song that you're just kind of using or a full score. It's, they're all, you know, sort of different animals in a way. Brett, you had our next question. Well, I'm very curious how you find a balance between work and personal life. Is it, is it fly fishing or meditation? Um, competitive badminton, perhaps? <laughs> I mean, you seem to have found the secret that allows you to consistently no, no. Well, work. You know what, you, you no. Um, one of the curses of of from, from now like, it's not a curse it's just what this is reality i don't really have a lot of hobbies because this is sort of an obsession for me um yeah i mean i enjoy my time at home i um we have a house in the caribbean i love going down there with the family and what you know when we get my 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 girls are grown now they're i enjoy, i do play tennis and occasionally narrowly avoid killing somebody with a golf ball um and yes i do actually meditate um mm -hmm. to a degree but yeah this is I, I think one of the common elements for people who are as prolific as i am is that it's kind of like <laughs> this is what i do every day it's not and it's not, it's not necessarily a matter of discipline it's just a matter of it's it's a the way I'm built and b the way I'm conditioned after all these years. It's just my studio is like my, you know, sure. my home. Absolutely. Well, you've seemed to find the secret that allows you to consistently create work that's beautiful and fresh, and yet you're unburdened, at least it appears to be, by your previous work and huge success. So congratulations uh, on you. that. At thank least it appears that way. No, I, well, no, I don't. Yeah, it's a big deal. Like you, you know, you have your children. You know, your children grow up and go out into the world, and they have their own lives. And for me, my shows have their own lives. I don't, you know, um, I don't want to control what happens with every production of Little Shop of Horrors or, or Beauty and the Beast, or whatever. You know, um, there are those involved who will be a little more uh, involved with every sort of facet of each production. I'm to me. I've said this before, I'm sure you've heard this. I, I think of myself like an architect who designs a structure that others will live in. 
and except when I'm when I do my concerts where I go on stage and I perform the songs, really it is they are part of a structure that um, you set in motion and then it's it's out in the world, um, and I, I love that. Um, yeah. yeah. There's just yeah. something so great to hearing you perform those songs, by the way. And uh, you were doing <laughs> a lot of that for raising funds during COVID. So thank you for that. But my question was uh, that we're going back to the beginning. There, There is kind of this legendary tale, and I wanted to know if it's accurate or not, that Roy Disney and Jeffrey Katzenberg come and see Little Shop of Horrors, and then they decide that they uh, need to take Howard Ashman and Alan Menken and, and get them to Disney. Well, if, if I'd, I'd love to know where you heard that tale. I've never heard that tale personally. Here's what I think basically happened. I don't. I mean, I don't think Roy came to see much music, especially off Broadway musical theater. Although Roy was the keeper of the flame as far as wanting animation to come back with the power that it had, you know, in the heyday of of Walt's classics. When we did Little Shop of Horrors, we had three producers. In New York, we had this Albert Poland and the Schubert Organization. In London, Cameron McIntosh. And in Los Angeles, David Geffen. The three of them, th the three people, but also entities in a way, uh, first had partnered do in doing Cats, which was the same time as Little Shop. So that entity came and said, let's do Little Shop of Horrors. So, uh, I believe it was probably David Geffen who got to know Howard and got to know Howard's amazing talent, who sort of whispered in the ear of, I think, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who had then come over mm. with that new regime of, of um, Michael, Michael Eisner, Eisner and, and um, Frank Wells and Jeffrey Katzenberg and others um, to run Disney. And I'm sure um, David Geffen whispered in Jeffrey Kassenberg's ear and said, that Ashman guy, he, he really understands how to use um, songs and musical styles to drive a story. And they, as I remember, they came to him with three different projects to consider. One was the, the Tina Turner autobiography, which was called I, Tina. And that became What's Love Got to Do With It? I think Howard did a treatment of that. Um, and and uh, a live action Thief of Baghdad, which I'm sure found its way into um, our work on Aladdin and The Little Mermaid. And Howard said that's the one that he was interested in. And then Howard had a choice as to whether to come back and work with me or to continue. He had, he had done a, a musical called Smile with the late Marvin Hamlish. And Howard came back to work with me. And um, and it was uh, amazing timing. And of course, for me, it was amazing timing because all, all the VHSs, you know, the, the, the people don't know what VHS means anymore. The videotapes of, of the Disney classics was the first time you could actually see these movies without waiting five years for the re-release and going to the theaters. And I would sit and watch it with my daughters and it was just go, oh my God, this stuff is incredible. And it's, especially as a, as a parent with a child, and in a time it's kind of dark, at that time was when the AIDS crisis was rearing its you know head. And, and um, to sit and watch those was just, it was the most amazing safe space in the world. Mm -hmm. And then I get this call from Howard saying, hey, maybe you want to work together on this thing? And um, it was Little Mermaid. It's just incredible. Thank you for walking us through it because that me that moment, those you two coming to Disney, it, it means so much to million, literally millions of people that that happens. So, so thank you for that, uh, Vanessa. Oh, I know I, I so believe me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm glad you brought up Little Shop of Horrors because we would be remiss if we didn't ask you a little bit about it. Uh, so I know you share this story often, but I just love that your father's background was actually a dentist. All your, the men in my family. family. Yeah, All so could you kind of tell us about that and their reaction to the show? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, uh, so my grandfather, who was initially named after him, actually, because my real first name is Irwin, Irwin Allen Menken. It was Irwin Menken and had an office on 120th Street and 3rd Avenue in, in Manhattan. And then his sons um, 
Norman and George worked then became dentists and worked in the office. Um, George then became an orthodontist, but he, and then my mother's sister's husband was a dentist. My father's sister's husband was a dentist. My cousins were dentists. So it was just, that was number one. Number two, um, my dad was also a pioneer in the use of nitrous oxide. Um, and he, he was actually president of the New York chapter of the American Analgesia Society at the time that I wrote Little Shop. And, but, you know, Howard and I um, took on this story and we couldn't figure out how are we going to end act, act one and how is Seymour going to commit the first murder? And in the movie, he, he's, he's standing, I think, on a bridge and he, he just gets frustrated and he throws a bottle and it hits a bum in the head and the bum falls over and he feeds it to Audrey too. Is that, I don't think it's going to necessarily work. I mean, maybe it would, but you know, for a musical, you really want things to be more motivated, more connected. And Howard had already made something out of the dentist, the sadistic dentist in the original movie being um, Audrey's boyfriend. So I thought knowing about nitrous oxide, wouldn't it be funny if maybe he likes to give himself the nitrous oxide and he asphyxiates himself by getting the mask stuck. And Howard thought that was hilarious. And so that's what we did. And then as I always did, I, I had a cassette of the songs and I, uh, I, I let my parents hear the show I was working on. So I sent it to them and I get a call from my mother on the, the answering machine. Boop. Hi, Alan. <laughs> it's mom. We heard the, <laughs> the tape. Oh, uh, okay. Blink. Um, <laughs> so I come home <laughs> and, and, and I go, uh, and Janice goes, oh, I think maybe your mom, she's just so moved. I said, I don't think so. So I call up and she goes, well, how would you feel if you had devoted your life to promoting the use of nitrous oxide is safe and your son's right to make this show where a man left himself to death. I'm like, and I felt terrible. I called Howard. I said, oh my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to He just laughed. Um, <laughs> And of course, the show opened, became a big hit, and my father um, and my mother certainly forgot very quickly about any uh, misgivings they had. And in fact, you know, when the dentist would say, look, Seymour, this could happen to you, and he holds up this, this hideous picture of teeth or an x-ray or whatever it would be, that was from my, originally from my father's patients. Such so. a good story. Oh, wow. I love that. Thank yeah. you for sharing that again. Sure. You know, we're all Broadway fanatics here, but I have to ask you about Newsies for a second, if I may, because uh, when I first went to college, that was the first time I ever saw that movie. It was my freshman year in college, like you know, 13 or 14 years after its release. But that movie took on such a cult following and the fans of that movie kept it so alive that now it's a very, very famous and, and well, successful yeah. Broadway. <laughs> of course. And, and of course, the, the biggest um, example of how how crazy and almost absurd that juxtaposition is the night of of the oscars for beauty and the beast i had four nom i had three best song nominations and a best score nomination and i won the song and i won score and i go backstage a, a, a journalist says but how does it feel to win the razzie for worst song of the year and i said <laughs> what i, th I said oh from newsies uh high times hard times from newsies because it was an enormous flop it was an enormous flop and you fast forward i don't know how many decades and i win my first and only tony award for newsies the, the stage musical of newsies so the movie took on a real cult following in the years that followed it's completely disastrous uh, opening in theaters you know, first it was you know on tape and then um, on cable, and then kids just really responded to the, I think, with the songs primarily. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe a young Christian Bale didn't hurt. Um, <laughs> and um, years, years later, when um, Tom Schumacher at Disney said, we want to do a stock at amateur version of Newsies, because people were pirating it all over the place. They were like yep. taking down the dialogue from the movie and 
finding the songs and just going in camps and in schools doing their own versions of it. Disney notices that kind of thing and said, let's do a stock and amateur version. So at least have something. But Alan, you don't have to worry about it. We'll get someone else to do the new songs, but I just want to let you know. And I said, no, 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 no. I was wondering this. You actually told them, no, I'm doing this? No, no. Yes, my baby. I wouldn't. I, what, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I can't let go of my, I can let go of my babies when they're written and they're out in the world. But when it comes to actually writing new material, I want to do that um, whenever possible. Well, so, um, so I said, no, I want to do this. And they said, okay, reset. Um, and eventually I was here, it was Jack Feldman and I wrote the songs and I was here in this very studio, right over there. Harvey Firestein was sitting there. We were talking about doing, actually we were talking about doing um, Kinky Boots. Um, and he saw the DVD of, of Newsy sitting there and he goes, watch this. Um, and uh, I, I told him, you know, we're, he said, oh, I know what you should do with that. Um, I said, really? And I quickly, you know, got in touch with Tom Schumacher at Disney and said, Harvey Firestein would like to write the book on this. When you're interested, he said, let's talk. Anyway, you know, next thing you know, boom. Yep. I mean, it's incredible. And I think that you're right that it's the music, I think, that kept that alive. Because speaking as a college that was trying to, you know, uh, do those amateur productions in hallways uh, of our dorm room, um, everybody was just dancing, seize the day everywhere. Uh, I went to a very strange college. <laughs> no, it's not strange at all. I, I remember walking into the local mall and I hear dum, 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 da, da, and they're doing <laughs> seize the day or carrying the banner or the world will know and go, whoa, look what's going on here. So actually, you know, it's it's great because you mentioned those kids growing up on Newsies, and we actually have a couple of friends that will be staging Newsies in the relatively near future, and they're just so excited uh, to be able to do that too. So it does continue to live on. Um, but Brett, I know that you had a question about D23. At D23 Expo 2013, you shared the stage with a fellow Disney legend, Richard Sherman. And at the press line after the concert, Richard said that after hearing yours and Howard's the Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, he said, it's coming back, the great Disney music, which, I mean, that's an amazing right. compliment. And certainly- He's a, he's a really lovely man. Well, can um, you tell I, us a little bit about him or the concert? Uh, or your well, I do remember, um, I remember on the night of the Oscars for Aladdin, you know, we, we finished the, we have the awards in our hands and we go to the, Disney's having a, uh, you know, he goes to various parties. One was a Disney party, and I get there, and I come in, and the first person waiting for us is Richard and Elizabeth, um, and it was just so touching. It was so touching, um, and you know, means the world. He's he's a you know, the Sherman brothers wrote wonderful, wonderful songs and had obviously wonderful movies. And they passed the torch and they did it with love. And it was, uh, it was really special to have that, you know, that kind of uh, welcome from, from him. You know, what's great is that you're sitting there and you mentioned that you're in your studio and it's just incredible to think about the uh, amount of music that has come from your studio. And in particular, you t seem to be able to kind of reinvent your sound and bring in different cultures and bring in so much into your music. Your scores uh, hardly look alike or sound alike. And there's always this kind of new musical identity that you take on. Is that something that you go out and choose those okay. types of projects to find new uh, well, challenges for yourself or? Yeah, I mean, to a degree, or I try to find a musical style that will be unique to a project. So either, it'll, you know, I mean, in the, I was approached to do the stage musical of Sister Act. Um, by, it was by Peter Schneider, who had been, uh, well, he was the head of the studio at one point, but he also had been, I knew Peter from, from all the way back to when he was company manager for Little Shop of Horrors off Broadway, and then was, um, vice president in charge of animation at Disney and then worked his way up to being head of the studio. Uh, but then when he left, one of the things he wanted to do was direct. And he was initially developing Sister Act as a state musical. And I thought, 
mm, what do I want to do with this? Because it's, you know, that R&B and Motown sound really is very much Little Shop world. And I said, what, I, I had always thought there has not been a, a, a stage musical with a storyline that's driven by um, disco and 70s style of, of pop music, which is a very special um, kind of uh, blend of, of styles. And um, when we did, you know, Aladdin, and you think, well, is it all going to be just Middle Eastern influenced music? And really, the main idea was we wanted to do that wink at the Hollywood take on the mysterious East. And that, you know, it goes back to the Fleischer cartoons, and it goes to certainly to the road pictures of, of Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. And then when it came to uh, the genie, when you went in the storyline, the genie of the ring, um, there's a genie of the of the lamp and genie of the ring. Genie of the ring is described as being being uh, black and having an earring, and it's kind of like a hipster. We, so Harlem jazz came to mind. Um, so th this whole Fats Waller style just you know just fit perfectly. Finding the styles that inform you know, what you're doing, whether being literal or whether, you know, taking you into a world or, or, or a world of associations. That's for us. It's, I mean, it started with Howard's and my very first musical, God bless you, Mr. Rosewater, and certainly enormously on Little Shop of Horrors. Um, and, and every project since is I've, I, I look for something that allows me to open up to a world. Um, and sometimes it's not even my idea. In the case of, of Hercules, I thought I was going to do something that was kind of a wink at Candide or classical music or, you know, very, because it's Greek and Greek, you know, classics. And John Musker and Ron Clements thought, no, he thought maybe gospel. I go, gospel? Why? But it ended up being brilliant. Um, and, um, and I was, I, you know, again, created a world that was, different from the little shop world, from the sister act world, from the, I don't know, a Bronx tale world, which is sort of the music of Belmont Avenue or from Tangled, which is um, f folk rock and, and just Joni Mitchell. And you go to uh, obviously Hunchback, which is his own world of, of um, the Latin liturgy and, and French um, classical music and Boulevard and, and Pocahontas, which is clearly of, of of Indians and English. It was much very literal pulling on that. And sometimes it's undefined, like to, to, to define what world Newsies is, not easy. Mm -hmm. It's it's somewhere between maybe ragtime and R and B. And then it just went where it went and but it was its own world. So I yes, I always look for a world that the projects can be in as much as possible. That's fantastic. And it always seems to, like I say, have, it, it's obviously a Mencken sound, but at the same time, it is respectful to the genre that it's coming from. And it, it's just always so wonderful. We absolutely love hearing them. Vanessa, you've got our next question. Yes. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned Hercules because that has to be one of the most fun soundtracks that you can sing along to. Um, when we interviewed Susan Egan, she told us this great behind the scenes story about how she was supposed to do a run. And she's like, no, no, I, I really don't do that. And I think it was you that maybe plucked out the notes for her to, to end the song. Uh, so I was wondering, did you have any fun behind the scenes stories? Uh, because it's gospel. I mean, what's more fun than that? <laughs> mm. Well, um, God, there's so many, I mean, behind, for Hercules in particular. Yeah. That, there's behind the scenes stories for so many of them. Um, I mean, the muses were so great to work with. Um, you know, um, Roz Ryan, Lilius White, um, they were so wonderful. We had so much fun. Um, and, and working in, you know, with, with these great black choir, you know, uh, gospel influence with black singers and choirs was such a, a joy for me. 
you know, other behind the scenes stories. I can tell you, you know, Roger Bart to me is the most incredible voice. Mm-hmm. He is the tenor voice that I, maybe the best tenor voice. And people probably know him, most of the people in the world know him simply as a, an actor in, in movies now. But Roger, oh my God, you could just belt to the stars. And I guess, you, I don't know if you know, but he actually, I actually he played Hades in the Central Park version, the stage version that we did. So fantastic. Um, always wanted to have a, you know, tried to have a, a song for Hades in the movie, but that that never really worked. But the behind the scenes was, yeah, it was just a delight. To, to, um, we, I, you know, we had a great song. Initially, we had a song called Shooting Star as the, as the song for Hercules. It was a beautiful song. Um, really lovely and it was just too soft it was too gentle too much a disney i want song and so i I, we said you know we need something with more muscle and it won't go the distance and that just nailed it yeah i would say so i do also want to tell you that i some of the songs that you've written just bring me to tears songs like out there uh, evermore colors of the wind and i wanted to ask you how do you put so much emotion into these songs what's the structure or strategy when you're given this task you know well i i try to figure out obviously i wanted to know the character know what the character wants know what the moment is for that character. Um, Try to get all the nuances of what you want for that moment. You know, where does the song start? Where does the song end? Um, All of that. And then I try to be as much a conduit as I can and just let it, you know, pour through me. Um, And as it comes through me, go, that's good. (laughs) Yeah, I don't like it. And also, as much as possible, have my collaborator in the room to say, oh, that's good. Or eh. um, beyond that, is, I don't know where, you know, where it comes yeah. from is, um, is just listening to and feeling the emotion that a piece of music brings up. Music is a vocabulary, so you're, you're drawing on associations that people have with that music, whether it's literal or whether it's subconscious, but it's very powerful. Um, and you can, o- you can always tell the difference between a song is just kind of putting the chords to some uh, some lyrics and having some you know nice melody to end something that really is pulling from somewhere. Um, and so you always just want to hold out for that quality and uh, that's what i try to do excellent that's fantastic brett i think (laughs) you have our next question well enchanted is one of my favorite films and being a disney fan former cast member and all that when when i sat down to to watch the film i for a moment i was like going well what's this going to be like you know i was a little nervous but after like the first moments of the film and the first song i knew that you uh, well, I knew that that the film was going to be able to find the perfect balance of gentle and loving parody and a genuine tribute to the songs of, you know, Snow White and other Disney right. classic films. So how are you able to find that balance? Well, that's not just me alone, obviously. First of all, oh, Stephen Schwartz is a part. brilliant, brilliant collaborator. And, and Kevin Lima, who directed the original movie, was, was wonderful to work with. Now the the, the um, sequel is coming, and that Adam Shankman is directing that, and S- S- Stephen and I reteamed for that. And this really wanted, to, first of all, that it, for the opening in Andalasia, really wanted what feels like the world of Snow White, or the world of Cinderella. You I, you want to get people right back to that place. So you know, it's working with those vocabularies. You, it's all about homage. You being a very genuine homage to a sensibility that you want to bring to that moment. You always want a, an audience in, in any given song moment to go, oh, I get it. I get it. You're doing this. Right. Um, you, they want, you want them to know, because the vocabulary of a song is 
very much commenting on so it, it offers so much subtext to what the words are saying and it's so powerful I've, I've always been of the opinion that in a really well written song in the context of a musical you should be able to get to the song moment turn off the words just hear the music playing and and get you know, at least 50 percent of what the moment and what the what it's all about just from the choice of music well i well to bring the story and and it was a way that um, that, that brought the audience in and uh, with a little bit of a wink and a little bit of a nudge nudge and it was wonderful and amy and the whole cast but especially amy adams oh was, yeah you know, just finding the perfect princess but as you said you were mentioning uh, the disenchanted is there anything you can share about your work with that it's good, good. <laughs> it's really good. It. i cannot um, wait for it you're I, going cannot, to, I, I think wait. people are going to love it it's it, it's really good and i mean it's got i think twice as many songs as the original and they're all good oh, so oh it, wow yeah oh, it's they really they've let us go whole hog it's a great premise story premise um amy again is amazing patrick dempsey is back uh, uh oh, we have a big song for adina menzel nancy oh good oh and wow that, yes okay. i know i know i know yes <laughs> we tried first time around we weren't able to get it in there um it's really nice of you to be able to bring uh her voice to the world right a little known <laughs> idina menzel right <laughs> yes exactly. um jimmy marsden um has, mm -hmm. you know and we have these a bunch of new people um who are singing um um maya rudolph um is is in it um we have two very really wonderful young talents but one play, playing morgan and um a, a new boyfriend so um i think it's wonderful and um and they just finished filming they filmed in dublin and i'm i'm now in the midst of scoring it right now and it's uh, i'm having a ball that's great. wonderful great if you're having a good time we are going to be having yeah you'll time. have a good yeah. time so thank you i promise <laughs> So, Alan, I don't know if you know this, but Lin-Manuel Miranda, he has said in uh, at least a couple interviews that I'm aware of uh, that he credits the music you and Howard Ashman wrote in The Little Mermaid, I think specifically uh, Under the Sea, as the reason for his career. Uh, because oh, I know this. I've known this very well since Lynn was a little boy. Um, Lynn went to the Hunter School to, uh, in New York and he actually was, I don't think he was in the same class as my niece, but they were, they knew each other. And I would hear from my sister all the time, there's this boy, Lin-Manuel Miranda, and he's constantly just bothering Jenny about wanting to know details about Little Mermaid, and could, could your uncle sign this, and could you get tickets for that? And he just was so enthusiastic, I mean, he was just obsessed. And of course, now we all, you know, we all know the, who little Lin-Manuel Miranda is in the world, and that's exactly who he is. Um, he's just the ultimate enthusiast. And, uh, you know, he, he named his son Sebastian. Um, I guess you probably know that the, there are five new songs in the new uh, live action Little Mermaid that I wrote with Lin in our new collaboration. And we had a great time working together. And yes, I knew very well. Uh, Lynn Manuel, also Bobby Lopez, mm -hmm. went to Hunter School, and I actually one of his college recommendation letters. And I think when he finished college, he asked about being my assistant. It's a very small world. Wow, small world. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, We're beyond the mouse, so you know. Yeah. Do not yes. get past that, so you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is. It is. You know, it's. Um, you know, when my daughter went to Michigan, they said, oh, this is these, these two young, two writers who are here in Michigan and, and everyone loves their work. It's just called them Pasek and Paul, Pasek and Paul. I go, oh, isn't that great? They're like, they have that name and they're just college students and Pasek and Paul, here they are. And I, I collaborated with them, you know, ended up collaborating with them on um, the Aladdin movie on Speechless. And again, I love them. They're such, such great talents. So it's, yeah, they, I, we planted these seeds that obviously are bearing fruit. Yes, absolutely. Brett, I think you have um, maybe our second to last question. Well, what advice would you give aspiring composers, musicians, or actor singers? Um, I would 
safely say that it's a shared dream of four because we'll include Jeremy Disney podcasters who met during community theater to be a part of a singing chorus in an Alan Menken soundtrack. Do you have any auditions coming up? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But. Okay. Okay. Any, Good try. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. <laughs> so, any any advice that you would give to? Oh uh, well, first of all. Make sure it's the thing that you want to do every day. Mm. If you, I mean, because do with your life the, the thing that you want to do every day. That's what you're going to end up doing anyway. Um, never fall in love with your own work. You know, put your love into it and put it out there and then always be ready to throw something out and write something else. Always be ready to just throw it away and write something else. It's bigger than you. It's, it's bigger than you write for the characters, write for the story. Do not, unless you're going to be, you know, Bob Dylan or Paul Simon or someone who, who is a singer songwriter who uses their own lives as, as their storyline. It's not about you. It's, it is about the characters. It's about um, the musical. It's about the collaboration and you and other people and giving yourself over to that assignment. Um, never start writing a song until you've really thought out what the song is, what the song, the, the bigger picture of what the song um, should sound like, what world the song is in, what song, if you were going to take a song from somewhere else in the world and just say, that's the, that's the kind of song that should be right there, figure that out before you write it. So you really have all these parameters set up so you go, okay. I'm going to now I'm going to turn on the faucet and I'm going into this very specific space. But, you know, I don't expect people to be able to, you know, take this advice and use it right away. But it's it's a long process, oh, you know, sure. digging well, for gold. And nobody has ever stuck a, you know, very few people, let's put it this way, have ever stuck a shovel in the dirt and went, Bing! oh, gold, look. <laughs> no, it's like, you know, it's, it's sunken treasure. It takes a long time to get to it. But enjoy the journey getting to it. Well, thank you for that answer. It's not only, you know, it's not only um, advice, but it's also life lessons. And we always um, learn and get life lessons from whoever we speak to. So thank you for that. You're welcome. So I have the pleasure of uh, starting to wrap us up. And uh, one of the things that all of us really enjoy is also the Disney parks. And I know that you have been oh. around the parks quite a bit. So we like to do what we call a rapid fire section. But of course, you are allowed to, uh, you can give as long of an answer as you'd like, because certainly I am not going to tell you to stop talking. So uh, okay. but here is some of the questions that we have for you. So what okay. is your favorite Disney park attraction? <sighs> Well, it's gone now. Can I, can I tell ones that are gone or should I stick? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Well, I used to love the great movie ride. Mm. I used yes. to love the, the Norway pavilion. Now it's frozen, which is great. Fine. But I used to love Norway. Um, oh my God. There, you know, it's, it's, it's so much. Listen, I loved Splash Mountain and now, you know, we have to be very, there's a lot of um, I'm not sure how, what changes have been made, but I know because of Song of the South and the you know the racial stereotyping that was a part of it, not intentionally hurtful, but definitely culturally um, not as as healthy as it should be. Um, I, I some of that has changed, but you know the ride is something. The, you know the feeling of of, of zippity doo dah as you just having a day you know um in that whole atmosphere it's just wonderful it's it's uh um yeah there's so many wonderful rides and um, and experiences there my current uh, used to have uh soaring over yes mm -hmm. soaring over california and now it's soaring over the world oh just don't get me started. There's so much. Uh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. There's so much. Um, yeah. You said that you're the you're the cook in the house, so we have to ask: What's your favorite Disney food or snack? What's your go-to when you're in the park? Oh, okay. Let's see. At Epcot, 
I love going to the Mexico place. I got to tell you, mm-hmm. you, know, you got that, that volcano and you got the boat ride and, and I'm, forget, I'm, I'm forgetting them. I'm, for, I'm literally forgetting them. Oh, Any snacks. I love the, um, wait, 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 wait. Um, the California grill with a mm-hmm. few of the parks up there. Yes. Um, my kids love to have breakfast at, um, Oh, Hannah at the Polynesian? The Kona Cafe. Oh, the Kona Cafe. Oh, yes. Things like that. It's just, oh, um, yeah. you know, all those little, little wonderful um, moments. Um, the Beauty and the Beast uh, <laughs> dinner. So it's, the effects in there are great. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a lot of such wonderful. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. These two argue all the time. So this is just a really fun question for you. Are you okay (laughs) with turkey legs in the park? Are you not okay with turkey legs in the park? Can people consume those? Is that an okay thing for you? I have a big turkey leg. I have no idea what you're referring to. Okay. It is. It is. No, is it an issue? Is it really an issue? No, well, it's, it's just these two. It's, it's these, our Brett, banter. Brett thinks that they look a little too uh, Renaissance for him. Uh, they, he doesn't <laughs> and like I people think walking they're around. delicious. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm more of a dull whip person. <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, that's Is just that. staying on the air. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> um, no, no, the turkey like no, no, no. I don't know. Um, there are it was the snacks. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Of course, the Japanese pavilion has been. Oh my God. Do I love the Japanese pavilion? Mm-hmm. I think they are actually having now. They're building a, I supposedly a really high class sushi. Um, yes. Yeah. Wow. That I got to see. Always something to eat. That I got to see. Yeah. Um, so last couple of rapid fire questions here. Okay. I'm not going to ask you the uh, favorite Disney Renaissance animated film because that would be very difficult for you to say, I'm sure. Um, but what's your favorite classic animated film from Disney? Well, Fantasia. Mm-hmm. I know it doesn't have characters, um, but that it just... I think I shook me to my core. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then do you have a particular magic moment that's happened uh, either in a Disney park or something that just really comes to mind when you think about Disney magic? What uh, do you have anything that comes to mind? Well, let's see. There is no audience like a Disney audience. They are, they, I mean, their hearts are just so open um and um you feel protective towards them and and it makes you want to help contribute to that safe space for them and for the world um so there it's a very precious thing when i first came to disney um this was in the 80s and they just this new regime you felt it from the top of the company to the person sweeping the, um, you know, the garbage, there was a dedication to the tradition and to the meaning of it and to the essence of it. All, and it was amazing to be a part of that. Um, and please God, that should always remain because it's, it's a very, very, very special thing. And I'm proud that, you know, that the company has always maintained also really important social values and that's you know that that comes from the tradition and from the top and from the people who are involved um and the company is going through obviously a major change right now you know bob is bob Iger is moving on and um i think i've met bob chapik once um i don't remember very well you know now movies rather than opening in theaters are opening in, you know and streaming mm-hmm. a lot has changed and for those you know of us who still get to you know continue to work there more important than ever just you know keep the flame burning well thank, thank you, you so that. much for mm-hmm. keeping the flame burning for all of us uh, we are so uh, blessed to have been able to speak with you today so thank you thank you guys great to talk to you enjoy your one. chicken Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Enjoy the chicken. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Thank you so bye. much.
What an amazing experience that was for all of us to have. You know, it was just so incredible to get to talk to Alan about how he comes to his creative process because we all know the amazing body of work that Alan has produced uh, over many years and the amount of just joy and excitement he's brought into the world through his music. But to find that creative process and to get some of those stories of that creative process was just incredible. I'm going to go to you first, Jeremy. Uh, you did have to dip out a little bit early from the interview. So you, I just wanted to get your reaction to the time that you were able to spend with Alan Mankin. Yeah, it, uh, total dream come true. I apologize to everyone. My son was sick and I had to go and pick him up from school um, right in the middle of the interview. So believe me, when he's a little older, we are going to be having words about that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, it, it is just one of those things. I um, <laughs> got to meet one of my heroes um, in this interview and, and talk to him and tell him that he had an impact on my life and, and that his art made an impact on my life and continues to. And uh, just listening to the rest of the questions, um, I just always love the questions that you guys ask. And I just love that I got to be a part of that. So uh, I'm, I'm just blown away. And uh, come on back, Alan. We want, we want to talk to you again, especially when like Disenchanted's coming out. Absolutely. Of course. That, that invitation is, of course, always open. Always uh, open. Vanessa, Vanessa, what were your thoughts of the interview we just had? You seem to have almost a special connection with Alan Mankin. We are friends now. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but yeah, no, I just, I really enjoyed hearing what he had to say about his career and his music, but most of all, I loved hearing what his family thinks of him, what his, what he is outside of this career that everybody knows. Cause at the end of the day, he goes home with his family. And as we found out, he's the cook and he likes chicken. And we're coming over for dinner. So I hope you prepared a sauce to go with that chicken as well. Absolutely. Brett, your thoughts about the conversation we were able to have the other day. We all we all have egos, but Alan Menken has an egot for a reason. I mean, he has kindness and joy and the ability to bring all of us together through shared experiences. And I'm so glad we had the opportunity to talk to him. An amazing time. That oh is uh, one thing I wanted to mention is the, the, how humble Alan is because in researching this, I was listening to a lot of interviews. I was going back and reading a lot on Alan Menken and he's always so forward with giving credit to other people and to uh, saying things like, you know, when people bring up his EGOT, he immediately brings up his Razzie that he won as well. It's just that, uh, like you were saying, Brett, that like type of, friendliness and humble nature that he has that I think uh, makes him just that much more interesting to get to interact with and to talk to, because obviously he's a creative genius, but it's also, we got to see a little bit of the human side of him today too. And that's something I truly will never forget. It's been just wonderful getting to talk to Alan Mankin today and to the other <laughs> Disney legends we've had the chance to speak to. Yes, to Vanessa? You, Craig, it is still so crazy to me to hear us say those words. So when we talk to Alan Mankin, what is, <laughs> I know. What is this what? life that we what? have this is wild it's, sorry wow. sorry to uh, derail you but i mean <laughs> do you hear yourself saying those words are you so surprised that you're saying those words well we need to be humble too because we're <laughs> but yeah. I I, I, it's because i'm so surprised i'm just like yeah. I, I i do feel humble in that we are, we are i'm, I'm so surprised that he is giving us us his time that's yeah. just so wild that i i just so appreciate it it's it's still bizarre to me that, that an EGOT winner would, would take the time for little old us. I don't know. I think you guys should lean into it. Like when the first Little Mermaid trailer comes out, you should just be online and be like, hey guys, we'll ask Alan what he thought of this trailer. You know, just stand by. <laughs> <laughs> That's, oh, if only. Uh, Definitely, Vanessa has brought that up with other uh, folks that we've interviewed in the past that maybe the name dropping uh, will probably continue for a while, but it has been just incredible. You know, if you are brand new to the podcast, we've had so many exceptional experiences, especially in this past 18 months or so, interviewing people from around the Disney company, including now Alan Menken was our seventh 
Disney legend that we were able to uh, interview, which is just incredible to think about and mind-blowing, truly. So if you want to go back and listen to those interviews, please find Beyond the Mouse on any podcast platform of your choice uh, and certainly check all of those episodes out. We do also just have fun with usually the three of us. Jeremy was kind of a special co-host today, but the yeah, three I don't, of us I do- don't get in on the fun. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh, yeah. We do Disney drafts. We do uh, Disney park news. We talk all things about the parks. Uh, we talk a lot about Will Turner, apparently. Now yes. That's a thing. <laughs> so <laughs> if you haven't listened to our recent draft on Heroes, please do yourself a favor and go oh, listen to that right. episode. Did it somebody is... take Will Turner before Captain Jack Sparrow? Uh, yes. you'll just have you Lord. I know that we are recording this prior to the release uh Jeremy but this is a must listen I will have to tell you that that <laughs> Disney draft episode I have never laughed harder while editing a podcast um, but truly thank you again uh to Alan Mankin for uh the opportunity to speak to him today and just for that amazing impact that he's put out into the world if you do want to continue to follow us on social media you can also find us on beyond the mouse pod uh, on Instagram, also Beyond Mouse on Twitter, and Beyond the Mouse Podcast on Facebook. We also do have a Facebook group, Beyond the Mouse Podcast Pals. They are going to be the first people to learn about our conversation with Alan Mankin. So definitely go and check out that group. We love interacting and talking to our listeners as well. And you can even help us decide what content we go to next as far as conversations we get to have amongst the three of us. It's just really been such a fun and great ride on the show. And we want to keep that energy and that momentum going any final thoughts before we get out of here brett i'll go to you first it's really hard to put into words um, what that experience was like because it was just so amazing and i am so thrilled and so excited with this interview and so many of the other interviews and that uh, you have this opportunity to talk to some amazing people that have impacted our lives, our personal lives, and then also our Disney fan lives. Oh my gosh. Okay, Jeremy, your final thoughts? Uh, just an incredible man, incredible interview. And uh, when are you guys getting Bob Iger on the on the horn here? <laughs> I don't know about any of that. <laughs> but Vanessa... Do you mean Robert? <laughs> Robert, we're, we're, yes. we're gonna have a chicken sometime soon I'm your good sure. friend Robert yes oh have him gosh. over <laughs> oh boy uh for me Craig I'm just curious if Alan serves a starch with the chicken if it's all vegetables on the side I just mm. want to know what I'm gonna be in for when I when we all finally show up to dinner uh for that chicken I know we're kind of invited ourselves but you know if the door's open <laughs> It's just solid I will say, right uh, there. solid questioning. I will say that uh, was that was a moment for sure uh, in the conversation. So thank you for allowing us to experience that moment together. So for Beyond the Mouse, I am Craig. I'm Vanessa. I'm Brett. I'm Jeremy. And we will see you real soon in the front row. Probably in the front row of Disenchanted and The Little Mermaid. We have so oh, much Alan Menken coming up into the world. Be so exciting. I can't wait. <laughs>